and Hebrews 11. Okay, if you didn't grab a bulletin, sorry, you're lost. Okay, on the back I've got a bunch of references that I'm going to reference, not read per se. This is a mysterious idea, mysterious doctrine. I would not suggest to have Donnie pick up the offering anymore because I saw him put some in his pocket. I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> oh, he's getting bullets. Oh, no, nah, he's expecting them to pass them out. Okay. Okay, Genesis 5. Okay, and then uh, Hebrews 11 eventually get to that. So uh, let's go ahead and pray. And Lord, I do ask you to help us, give us wisdom, uh, give us uh, discernment. I pray that the Spirit of God would enlighten our minds, our eyes, that we might understand this uh, mysterious doctrine. I pray that you'd help us to also to uh, understand it and to look forward uh, to it and pray for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Genesis 5, verse 18, uh, genealogies. Okay, Genesis 5, 18. And Jared lived in 160 and two years, and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 and two years, and he died. Okay, so he is, according to this record, the second oldest man, second oldest. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were uh, 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Where did he take him? He just took him. Uh, Methuselah, look at that name, and you'll see Selah at the end, the second half, Selah. Maybe some doctrinal things. Uh, but Methuselah, his name means when he is dead, it shall be sent. So the reason why it took over 100 years to build the ark, because Methuselah was trying to extend his life out. No, 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 stop it. Slow down. He was doing all the problems. And okay. So Methuselah lived 900 and, let's see, he lived 800 uh and 187 years he begat Lamech, and Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 782 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. So uh, Enoch's grandson is the oldest man in, in this record, and his dad was the second oldest, so he had... Uh, a pretty good chance of having some pretty good genes there to uh, live out that time. And, and God said, nope, you're missing 600 years. And I don't think he was sorry for that. Not at all. Not at all. So Enoch is a very interesting character. And so when we look at him, and if you would, let's try Hebrews 11.5. What, uh, what happened with Enoch? Now, there's uh, some folks that are digging up uh, some book called the Book of Enoch. And in order for it to be Enoch's book, that means uh, he had to pass it down to Methuselah, uh, who had to pass it over to Noah, who had to keep it on the ark. And, and then he had to keep reprinting it through the years. Uh, but uh, Hebrews 11, verse 5 is what happened to Enoch. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, if the book of Enoch, that's, you know, I got in my office if it is Enoch's, the only portion that God chose to put in the Bible is found in Jude, verse 14 and 15. That's it. So uh, if a person wants to pretend that it's really Enoch's writings, who knows? I don't know. Don't care. Uh, you might get some good things out of it. You might not. <laughs> but the only thing that God placed in the Bible that is definitely uh, credited to Enoch is in Jude 14 and 15. And you will see that Enoch had a favorite word. Okay, and uh, in verse 14, and Enoch also the seventh from Adam. It's interesting how God follows these numbers. 
seventh from Adam, number for perfection. Tenth, number for Gentiles, that's Noah. Number 13, the devil's number, that would have been Nimrod. Number 13. Okay, so then he says this. He, uh, Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And I'm sure people said, Oh, Enoch, they've been saying that for years. <laughs> So he prophesied about the second coming, greatest doctrine of the Bible. And then here's his comment about the society of his day in verse 15, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. (laughs) So if you ask Enoch what he thought of anything, the answer would have been ungodly. Kind of a negative fellow. Okay, but uh, so he, Enoch sees or saw what you and I are seeing advertised and being pushed today. And he said, ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. So Enoch is an unusual character, and he typifies something in the New Testament. And what he typifies is the rapture. Now, the word rapture is not found in the Bible, but it is defined to be a state of being carried away by overwhelming emotion. And definitely that's what's going to happen. Okay, and so I'm going to give you some ideas about the rapture uh, this morning. Uh, And the first thing is the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, while the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Okay, what does that mean? After the crucifixion, um, there's a couple of fellows walking down this road called Emmaus in Luke 24, and Jesus, after he rose from dead, came along beside them, and they were talking about the events of the week, and he's, and he's part of the conversation. And then he said to them, O oh, fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And beginning at Moses... He, at beginning of Moses, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Jesus Christ started showing those two guys about prophecies about him, all through the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, where the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Now, some of the prophecies in the Old Testament were, were fulfilled within the Old Testament. Like when uh, the walls of Jericho came down, he said, there's going to be a man that's going to rebuild these walls. He's going to start with it when his firstborn son is born, and he's going to put up the gates. He's going to complete the project when his last born is born. Is it loud enough? Everybody okay? Loud enough? Okay. Lord, good enough? Okay, so there's a prophecy that was fulfilled about 500 years later, but it was fulfilled under the Old Testament. In 1 Kings 13, was a young prophet. And he preached about this altar that that Jeroboam had set up. And it says 13 times that Jeroboam caused Israel to sin. And he said to that altar, there's going to be a day where a young man from the tribe of, from the uh, lineage of David by the name of Josiah that's going to burn the bones of priests upon you. And 350 years later, that happened. A young fellow named Josiah of the tribe of of the uh, lineage of David found these bones of these priests, and he, he took them and he threw them on the altar and then burned them. Okay, so then there are some predictions in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the New Testament. And if anybody's a gambler, that's what they look at. They follow the, the ratio of things, and, they, and that's what proves the Bible. For Jesus Christ to fulfill eight predictions where he was born, where he's raised. Okay, just eight The likelihood of that taking place, if you look at the gambling odds, the likelihood of that taking place is equal to the likelihood of you picking up a silver dollar, people don't know what that is, a half dollar, okay, uh, and put an X on it, fly over the state of Texas where somebody has filled the entire state two feet deep with with silver dollars, and you, and somebody takes a coin and puts an X on it, flies over the state and throws it out, and then puts you at the border and blindfolds you, and you have one chance to pick up the one with the X. That's the likelihood of Jesus fulfilling eight out of eight. He fulfilled 48 out of 48. 
Okay, that's what proves the Bible. Now, the Old Testament concealed, I'll give you some examples. New Testament revealed, Old Testament concealed, Abel offered a lamb sacrifice, God accepted it. Old Testament concealed something of the New Testament revealed where the Lamb of God is accepted as a sacrifice. You have uh, where Isaac is offered up as a sacrifice, the only son of Abraham, the son by promise per se, offered up as a sacrifice, Old Testament concealed, New Testament revealed, only begotten Son of God offered as a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, Joseph was uh, betrayed, not accepted by his brothers. Old Testament conceals a truth that's revealed in the New Testament where Jesus Christ is not accepted by his brothers, the Jewish kin. In the Old Testament, the Passover lamb, Old Testament conceals a prophecy of the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. Died on Calvary on Passover. Uh, in the Old Testament, Job pictures a, a tribulation saint. Job's got 42 chapters. And he's got a devil who d directly persecutes him. He is in the land of Uz. That's common day. That's common place as Jordan. Okay, down in Petra. He suffers. Okay, and he has a, re there's a resurrection at the end of, of the book of Job. Okay, and so he pictures a Jew in the tribulation time period who is in the land of Uz, uh, trying to survive the tribulation. In the Old Testament, you have Jeremiah was told by God you can't get married. Jeremiah 15, 6, 16, I think it is. And he pictures uh, the 12 tribes of Israel in the, new, in the tribulation time period where it's revealed that 144,000 Jewish men will run around the world and preach the gospel of the kingdom. In the Old Testament, Daniel had a book, 12 chapters. At the end of 12 chapters, the angel told him, seal it up. So he sealed up the book. Sealed up to the time of the end. The time of the end is Revelation, so Revelation reveals some of the things that Daniel had concealed in the Old Testament. King David in the Old Testament is a very unusual character. He is not a son of God per se. He's not born again. Nobody got born again in the Old Testament. But God treated him like a son, Okay, where he in type is picturing a New Testament believer where David is treated as a son. It's a son of God concealed where the born-again believer in the New Testament is revealed. So we run through those things. Now, during the ministry of the Lord Jesus, because there was a transition coming from Old Testament and New Testament, he started to introduce some of these ideas that's revealed, that was concealed in the Old Testament. When he was coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, the first he told the uh, Peter, James, and John, he said, tell the vision. So that's the only time you get television in the Bible. Tell the vision to no man, <clears throat> okay? And that would have been hard. Who? Man, you want to tell everybody what you saw, right? Tell the vision to no man until I'm risen from the dead. Mark 9, verse 9 and 10. And they, what? What's that mean? If you would look in John chapter 20, verse 9. From the dead? What are you talking about? You see, the only thing they knew in, in John chapter 11 about Lazarus, when he died, Jesus told him he's going to rise again. And she said, well, I know he's going to rise in the last day. Well, in John chapter 20, the apostles could not get that from the dead figured out, even though he told them several times. Why? It's a new idea coming through here, New Testament revealed. John 20, verse 9. And, as, and for as yet... They knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They couldn't figure that out. Meaning there's going to be a time period called the resurrection where the dead is risen from the dead and then they're judged at the white throne judgment. But Jesus said, I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to rise prematurely of the dead. And a bunch of people are. And that was new to them. As in John chapter 3, where Jesus Christ has a fellow named Nicodemus, and he's asking Jesus questions, and the Lord revealed the idea of the new birth that was concealed in Psalm 22, verse 30 and 31, where a seed is born to him in Psalm 22. That's a crucifixion psalm, and what gives credence to the new birth is the crucifixion. That was revealed to Nicodemus in John 3. And Jesus said, you're a master of Israel, don't know this? 
Then in John 14, before he's going into the res- going into the crucifixion, he introduced the Holy Ghost, who was concealed in the Old Testament, to the apostles. Now the Holy Ghost is in your body, and that took place in Acts 2 for them. Okay, where that's revealed. Now you and I can read the old, in the Old Testament. We can read Genesis one, where it says God created man in our image. We can say, oh, there's more than one Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but they didn't know that. That was concealed to them. It's revealed in the New Testament. Okay, now the major, the, most of the revealing of the concealment in the, old, in the Old Testament was given to a fellow named Paul. If you would look in Romans chapter 16. Okay, the Old Testament is often the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, where the perfect example is Daniel and Revelation. Revelation, revealing. Now, Paul is the character, Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Paul also writes about this in Luke, in Ephesians 3. But there's so much uh, scripture we're going on here, we'll just look at this one. Romans 16, 25. Now, to him that is of power, to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation, revealing, the revelation of the mystery, concealment under the Old Testament. There's mysterious things. Which was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, So we can read Old Testament prophets and still find some of those revelations because the Holy Ghost is revealing them to us. According to the commandment of God, of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Okay, so if that's true, God conceals the rapture through Enoch. And God reveals the rapture through Paul coming into the New Testament. Now, some will say, what about Elijah? Okay, so if you you take your Bible and you look at the end of Malachi, Malachi is the last uh, book in the Old Testament for our Gentile Bible. The Jewish uh, Bible, the Old Testament, what we call Old Testament, what they just call Bible, or whatever they call it, Scripture, Okay, they have the same 39 books that we have in the Old Testament, but they lay them out in different orders. They have Second Chronicles ending their Bible. And it's funny, the last thing said in Second Chronicles to the Jew, get back to Israel. So if you deal with some of these black guys on the street that says they're Israel, show them Second Chronicles and tell them to get out of here. Don't even argue the situation. I just laugh at them. Okay, but still the idea... And the last word in our Gentile Old Testament is the word curse, Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. And so anybody who's honest and looks at themselves and they read Genesis and Malachi will admit, man, I can't keep that. And so Galatians 3.13, 3 times 13, where it says Jesus Christ, Christ redeems us from the curse of the law, Malachi. So the last two characters you find in Malachi is in Malachi 4, verse 4 and 5, is Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah picture the law and the prophets. Moses and Elijah, they've been traveling, they've got frequent flying miles, and so they showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration that Peter, James, and John saw. Not only that, are they have, they have a time traveling machine where they're going to come back in the tribulation time period. And the reason why they're coming back, Moses died, he represents people who died twice. We well, have Lazarus and the widow of Nain and so forth and Jairus' daughter. So he died back there in, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, but it says in 34, no man could find a sepulcher. And the reason why they couldn't find a sepulcher is because the invasion of the body snatchers came in. And in Jude verse 9, Michael was told by God, go get that body. So he went down there and got that body. And like that. So Moses represents the law. Moses preached at Pharaoh. Pharaoh in Ezekiel chapter 29 is called the red dragon. He's a type of the Antichrist and maybe he wasn't flesh and blood man. Which I would probably lean on. 
Okay, so he preaches to a type of the Antichrist, Pharaoh, and there's 18 Antichrists in the Old Testament, or types, 18 of them. And the other one is Ahab. Ahab is a type of the Antichrist. He was married to Jezebel. Jezebel, her spirit shows up in Revelation 2 and 3, and her spirit is, uh, is very active in the church these days. It's called Jezebel's spirit. And the Ahab spirit kind of goes along with it, where Jezebel would be the domineering spirit. Ahab is like, yes, ma'am. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Okay, and so Ahab is a type of the Antichrist, and Elijah preached to him. Now, Elijah, when he was taken up in that chariot, the flaming flame, okay, he's coming back in Revelation chapter 11, where Moses and Elijah are going to pick up the two witnesses, and they're going to be able to throw out judgment just the way they did the first time. Plagues, kill people by fire, okay, drought, things like that's all taken again. And then they get beheaded by the Muslim, you know, type of the Antichrist. They get their, you know, new diet program, take 20 pounds of ugly fat. Okay, and then they're laying around for three days. And as everybody's rejoicing, which is about the only time, happy time in the trib. Maybe somebody's in the street and they see their body and they go over and kick and all of a sudden he goes, ooh. And then the head pops back on and oop, they go. Moses and Elijah. Okay, so they are very significant in that. Now if you would look in Galatians chapter 2. When you look at your Bible, God amazingly has the Bible laid out in a chronological fashion like a movie or a script. Where Hollywood, they, they, don't, they, they do not have any originality, so they find their script from the Bible where the old westerns will always be fighting over a water hole. You'll find that in Genesis. And then usually the movie will have a hero, a villain, and a woman are fighting over. And by the time you get 80% of the movie, the villain's got the hero on the train tracks. It looks like he's going to die. But somehow, miraculously, while you went out to the refrigerator to get something to eat, you came back in, and the hero is the winner. And he throws the villain in jail or kills him or hangs him or whatnot, and then he marries a fairy, fair maiden, and they live happily ever after. And that's Revelation. That's the Bible. But when you get to the back of the Bible, like you're fast-forwarding, you're fast-forwarding through a boring part of a show, uh, you're in the beginning of, the, of time, Genesis, and as you come through the Bible, you get to the back of your Bible, going with Hebrews, it takes a shift into the future, doctrinally. Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, kind of helps us out with this idea, where Paul writes about three guys, Peter, James, and John. And they make an agreement back there at this time. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. And we should go unto the heathen. We, Paul and Barnabas, unto the heathen, Gentiles, uncircumcision, and they unto the circumcision, Jews. This is why when James writes this epistle, and I believe it is James, not the half-brother of Jesus, he writes to the twelve tribes. And then the scattered ones in First Peter are Jews. And if you read the epistle, you can see that. And Second Peter, and First John, and Second John, and Third John. First John and Second John is the only times you find the words Antichrist in the Bible. Why? That's what he's writing about. And that he's given the whole book of Revelation, and then Jude throws in a bunch of ideas. So doctrinally speaking, when you're looking at your Bible from Hebrews to the end, you're looking primarily Jewish, secondarily Gentiles. Now, Paul was primarily Gentiles, but secondarily Jews. And so we, we need to understand that as far as our dispensations go, as far as the Bible's laid out, and we look at the covenants. Now, if you would, in Hebrews chapter 11, we'll go back to Enoch, because Enoch is the rapture concealed in the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. And it uses a specific word. So the Bible word for rapture, yes, I know the word rapture is not in the Bible, and neither is Trinity. Okay, but don't, it doesn't matter. The Bible word for Trinity is Godhead. The Bible word for rapture would be one of two choices. Translation or first resurrection. So those are the two choices. Hebrews 11, verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death. Very interesting statement. You're not going to see death. You're going to cheat the undertaker and go up with the upper taker. 
Okay, now this was told by Jesus to a lady in John, in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 51. So hold your finger, if you would, in Hebrews, and look at this one in John, John 8, 51. And Jesus Christ told uh, this uh, person, he was, who he's talking to, John eight fifty one. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. I'm looking in that chapter. I don't see a saying. What saying? Saying what? Birds of a feather flock together? No, I don't think that's the right one. Uh, saying, you know, uh, money talks? No, I don't think that's the right one. What saying is he talking about? Well, in the gospel, if you go later on, chapter 18, verse 32, we discover what his saying is. Chapter 18, verse 32, John 18, 32. Pilate made a statement, okay, and he declared a decree, and that fulfilled his saying. Verse 32, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death he should die. So the promise there is that there are some that are going to believe that saying or keep that saying, and you won't see death. And that's the ones who are alive at the rapture. Okay, now this idea, this translation, if you go back to Hebrews 11, verse 5, the word translation, translated, is found five times in the Bible. Three of them are in this one passage. The first time it occurs... Is in 2 Samuel 3, verse 10, where it says that God translated the kingdom of Saul to the kingdom of David. So the translation was better than the original. David's kingdom was better than Saul's. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it talks about a born-again believer, that, they, that the person is translated from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of light, and the translation is better than the original. My new man's better than the old man. And then in, in Hebrews, Enoch was translated from earth to heaven, and the translation was better off than the original. So we can apply that to this book also. Okay, but still the idea, that's the idea coming through there. Now after Enoch and Elijah both were translated, people try to find them. And Elisha was kind of embarrassed about it. They said, Elisha, we want to go find Elijah. He said, don't waste your time. I saw it. Well, we want to go look for him. I'm telling you, you're wasting your time. Well, we want to go look for him. Go look for him. And they did. They couldn't find him. And the same with Enoch. Couldn't find him. And so that might be significant. You know, the people are going to be looking around. And so... But this brings it into the mystery, because we read that idea of the mystery. Now, Paul is the one that lays it out for us. If you would, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter. And what's important, remember the Old Testament concealed as New Testament revealed. Now, in the Old Testament, Jewish men had to go to Jerusalem three times every year. Okay, they had to go during a feast. Now, is that not a way to get a man to go someplace? Hey, you got food. Okay, so they had to go uh, three times every year. One was, one was during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's early spring. The other is at the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, that's late spring. And then the third time is a Feast of Trumpets or Feast of Tabernacles, I'm sorry, in the fall. In the seventh month, 15th day of the month. So three times they had to do that. And those coincide with what's called the first resurrection. And it coincides with a harvest. First Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible likens a resurrection to a harvest. And anybody that puts a seed in the ground knows what happens. And in a harvest, you have three parts. Usually it will have maybe a, a fruit that comes right off the bat, that's first fruits, and then, then it seems like they all come. That's the main harvest. And then you got some stragglers. That would be the gleanings. So the first resurrection is not complete until the end of the tribulation time period. And so we got to divide it up somehow. The Bible divides it for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But every man in his own order. 
What order? Well, verse 22, you can see, in Christ shall all be made alive. So here's the division. For every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. So the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ took place during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, early spring. Okay, that would have been on a uh, Saturday night on our calendar, on a Sunday morning on a Jewish calendar, when he was crucified on a Wednesday, and then you run it, whereas Wednesday was a Passover that year. Okay, so he rose from the dead, and many Old Testament saints rose from the dead in early spring. And then it says, the passage says, afterward, afterward. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So that's what we would call the main harvest. That's what we would call the rapture. That's what the Bible calls the translation. And then the next verse is, then cometh the end. So what occurs after the main harvest? Then cometh the end. Those two words put together, and this is one advantage that if you have a Bible computer program over Strong's Concordance, if you look up Strong's Concordance, you've got to look up end every single time. And forget looking up the. Okay? But you can put in the end, hit phrase, and then it occurs over a hundred times in the Bible. Sometimes the end is just the end of that event. But there are times where the doctrine of that verse has an established meaning. And it's not the end of the world. It's the end of something. What is it the end of? Well, the most important, do or the most important prophecy of the Bible that lays out the calendar of the Bible is called Daniel's 70 weeks. That was established in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And that was 70 weeks. Now we know because of hindsight we look backwards on it. It's 490 years. And the angel Gabriel, when he interpreted that for Daniel, he split those 70 weeks in three points because he had three-point outline. That's how sermons go. Okay, so he had uh, seven weeks, three score, two weeks, 62, and then one hanging around, like a PS. That's when the preacher said, I'm closing. He doesn't mean it. He's lying. Okay, and so it's just kind of hanging around. Okay, that's how he broke it up. Now, the seven and the 62, 69 weeks, 483 years, that was complete on Palm Sunday. That was the day it was complete. On Monday starts the 70th week. On Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, and so forth. Until there was a time in the book of Acts where God picked up the sand clock and set it on the side. And so we got just a very few days gone of the 70th week. Now we're still hanging around waiting for that one. Now the first 69 weeks was between God and Israel. Jerusalem, sacrifices. That's what Daniel said. So that last week is the same. Now, Christians that think that they're going to tribulation, I just smile, tell them, have a good time. Uh, I said, I think you're going to be please, pleasantly surprised. Now, if you want to go into the tribulation, go ahead. Okay, but it, it takes a doctrinal shift to the end. What is the end? The end is the end of Daniel's 70 weeks. That's why in Matthew 24, verse 13, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Pentecostals will try to use that to hold people in bondage. That's not what it's talking about. You jump down to verse 21, it says great tribulation. You go to verse 14 and you'll read Daniel's prophecy. Verse 15, the abomination of de desolation. In verse 16, it talks about fleeing to the mountains, which is Petra. And it talks about Judea. That has nothing to do with America. That's all Israel. These guys miss out on, they miss all that stuff. And so that's very significant. What comes after the main harvest, according to 1 Corinthians, the end, the tribulation. You'll find it in Hebrews 3, 6, 3, 14. You'll find it in Hebrews 6. You'll find it in Hebrews 10, in James 5, the end. Ezekiel prophesies about it in Ezekiel 37, the end. It's called the last days. There's another phrase that's used for it, another two, part, two words used for it, called the last days. Found eight times in the Bible. Last days. Hebrews 1 verse 2, he has spoken unto a son in these last days. So Hebrews is a doctrinal present tense, last days, last days of the tribulation going into the millennium. Okay, that's if we allow the Bible to define its own terms. If a guy wants to put his own definitions in there, man, have at it, do all you want. It's all your, your own. So when you get to the back of the Bible, you've got Hebrews. How do we miss that? 
That's Jewish Christians. No, I think it's Hebrews. Well, that's Christians. No, I think it's Hebrews. Because that's what it said. Epistle to the Hebrews. And then James chapter 1, verse 1, James, the servant of God, James, an apostle to, what did Galatians say? Circumcision. James, the servant of God, to the, tw to the 12 tribes. That's Jews. First Peter, Jews. Second Peter, Jews. Primarily Jews. Doctrinally Jews. Secondarily, instructionally, we can pick, get some things out of there. Okay, so that's the, lay the, the layout of it. As far as that goes, if you would, try Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Uh, if you would, hope, hopefully you kept your finger in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll come back to that. But Revelation 20 reveals that this translation is a part of the first resurrection. Now, remember the Jews under the Old Testament covenant did not know about the judgment seat of Christ. That was revealed to Paul. They did not know of the judgment of the quick and the dead. Quick, saved, dead, uh, not lost, but righteous from Adam clear to the end. They didn't know about that. They only knew about one special, unique judgment at the end. They didn't know about the judgment seat of Christ. Nothing about that. That was concealed to them. Revelation chapter 20 writes this. In uh, verse 4, you can see that somebody is being beheaded. So therefore, that gives credence to the doctrine, H-I-R-J-A, of the Muslim culture, where they have a doctrine that they can immigrate to a foreign culture in order to Islamify that culture, and they get a quick trip to heaven. That's why they're going around the world. Now, in verse 5, it says, But the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. What is? At the end of the tribulation. What's the second one? The second major one is the white throne at chapter 20, verse 11. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Why? Because it's got three parts. On such a second death hath no power, but they that are, shall be priests of God and of Christ shall reign with him a thousand years. So what's that third part? That's the gleanings. The gleanings occur in the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation where some tribulation saints are raptured out at the end of the tribulation. You'll find that in Luke chapter 17 where two are standing, one is taken, one is stayed, two in a bit, one is taken, one is stayed. That's tribulation. That will be a picture of Job's children, and it, I, it looks like to me that Job had, they had ten kids, it says that, but then she had ten more. It looks like to me that the ten, the original ten, were resurrected from the dead, and then she had another ten. That's what my guess would be on that. But still, there's something very unique about that. Isaiah writes about this resurrection also. Now, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 15, this is called a mystery. 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, now 1 Corinthians chapter 4 talks about mysteries, that we are to be faithful stewards of the mysteries of God. And there are seven major mysteries in the New Testament. And so Paul is giving us one mystery. What is the mystery? 15, chapter 15, verse 51. But I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's a good, that's a good uh, plaque we can put in the nursery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> Okay, but then it says, how are we going to be changed? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For the, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall he be brought to... It shall be brought, uh, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So we cheat the undertaker. That's a good deal. Now, who got to see that? Paul also writes about that in 1 Thessalonians 4, if you want to look at that one. 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, this one he precedes it here with, I would not have you to be ignorant. 
That phrase is found seven times in the New Testament, six by Paul, one by Peter. So it's, it's a very important subject that he wants us to not ignore the rapture. Okay, and he writes about it in verse 13 down to 18. And this is a great promise, a mysterious promise for the born-again believer. Now, in John chapter 20, after Peter had confessed to Christ three times about his denial, he looked over at John and he said, what about him? What about him? And Jesus said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee, follow thou me? Now, that's all he said about John, if I will. They, they forgot the if I will. <clears throat> so they thought John was going to live till the rapture. Which he did. But he won't. But he did. He had a preview of it in Revelation 4 and 5. And if you want to see the script of what occurs after the rapture, Revelation 4 and 5 is what we read. And you'll see God the Father on the throne. A rainbow around the throne. The Holy Ghost. Four and twenty elders. You'll see the emerald. Uh, you'll hear four cherubs say, holy, 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 which was and is, is to come. On our face we go. We bow and worship the Father. And then, and then somebody, a strong angel walks in, probably Michael, and said, who's worthy to open the seven seals that's in the, you know, the hand of the Father standing, sitting there on the throne? And nobody says a word. It's quiet. Dead silence. And then somebody, one of the elders, yells out, as Jesus walks in, Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book thereof. Takes the book out of the Father's hand and he starts opening it up. Revelation 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay? And then an example of the gleanings rapture of the tribulation is Moses and Elijah where they're raptured in the trib. That's an example of it. So John is the one. Now this wonderful event, if a person would love to see that take place and would love his appearing. The Bible, Paul in particular, says that there's a crown that's given out. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. There's a crown that's going to be given out at the judgment seat to people who love his appearing. Now, a lot of us, if we're honest, when things aren't going well, we do pray more for the rapture. Now, the promise is not given to people who love our disappearing. There's a difference. To love our disappearing is just trying to get out of a mess we're in. And just think about that. The rapture is going to fix every problem you've ever had. For the lost man, the rapture is the beginning of all problems you will never believe you'll ever experience. It's going to be the worst time ever known to man. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Paul said this, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now, why is it called a crown of righteousness? It's because if a person has the mindset that Jesus could come back today, I would dare say they're going to have a they clean up their act a little better. 1 John chapter 3 writes it this way. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. But it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. If a person says, he ain't coming back for another ten decades, the general viewpoint is, maybe the person wants to live uh, the way he wants to live. If a person, if a born-again believer believes, well, the Lord could come back today, I don't want to have my hand in the cookie jar when he comes back. I don't want to be in a place where I'm not supposed to be, and boom, I'm in heaven, and then I remember where I was, and then the face gets red. Okay? Why? Because if we believe in his appearing can happen like that, then we're going to be careful. 
and we're going to live a more pure life. That's why it's called the crown of righteousness. And I would dare say today would be a good day for that. Okay, but that's one of the crowns. <clears throat> that's a mystery that God used as concealment with Enoch, but he reveals it to the Apostle Paul. And that's the greatest prayer that we can pray in the Bible. At the end of the Bible it says, even so come, Lord Jesus. Okay, so we'll stop there and pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to be <clears throat> people that look forward to that appearing. And I pray you'd help us to look forward to that great day. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to understand the rightly dividing the word of truth, so very important. And that we will be, uh, that born again people will experience what an enraptured, and enrap- if we would be enraptured with Jesus Christ, then we will love his appearing. Help us to think about him and him and live our lives so we might be in living and pleasing to him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we'll be dismissed.